Once again, good morning, church. Good to see you all here, and especially for those who are here for the first time. I really want to welcome you. Um, so today's passage is from the book of First Samuel, chapter 17, verse 41 through 47. So if you could, would you all arise, and we're going to proclaim the word of God together. And we will take turn to proclaim the words. I'm going to go first. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with the sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Okay, so this is the last word, so let's proclaim together. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. Amen. You may be seated. Um, so uh, I want to just, you know, um, express my gratitude for all the veterans, and uh, I think today's passage kind of goes well with the, you know, uh, for those who serve this nation as the soldiers, right? Um, if you search for David in Google, uh, one of the first related searches that comes up is David and Goliath. Uh, you know, making today's passage almost indispensable uh, sin, indispensable sin in David's life. Uh, one day, uh, not too long ago, my uh, youngest daughter, um, Rua, asked me a question. Uh, she's like, Daddy, what are you most uh, afraid of? I don't know if, if you've received any kind of questions like that, you know, uh, from uh, your, your children uh, back in the days. But uh, I couldn't really think of any specific uh, uh, things that I'm afraid of. That doesn't mean that, you know, like, I'm immune to any of, you know, uh, things that I should be afraid of. Uh, but I couldn't really think of any uh, specific things. Now, let me ask you the same question this morning. What are you most afraid of? Okay, I think we're getting some answers here. Um, I was going to say to my daughter, like, you know, I'm afraid of cockroaches, but <laughs> I hate it, but I don't know if I can say it, and therefore I'm afraid of it or not. But, uh, you know, we have some fears in our hearts. Deep in our hearts, we have something that we are afraid of. Um, so whatever that is, uh, whatever fears may be lurking within us, I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in us today as we worship the Lord. Amen? That He will just cast out all that fears throughout this worship service. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 11, which is the backdrop, background of the text, we can see that Saul and all Israel were gripped by great fear. Verse 11, it goes, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Basically, you know, they were all aware that, you know, God, Goliath's size, Goliath's size was no joke, right? Um, you know, they all knew that this, this giant's ability to fight in a battle, his 
uh, uh, you know, like this combat abilities and fighting skills were well known. Um, while they suddenly feared Goliath's enormous stature and strength, when you look at closer, upon closer examination, they were deeply afraid after hearing his words. So what did he say? And what did he say that struck fear in them? He proposed a challenge. So we know the story, right? That one representative like warrior from Israel fight him one-on-one. That was the deal. That was the proposal. And uh, if the Israelite lost, then uh, the entire nation of Israel would become subjects of the Philistines. On the other hand, if Goliath lost, the Philistines would serve Israel. So that was, you know, his proposal. And uh, just, you know, uh, using our common sense, it would be very hard to find someone capable of defeating Goliath, right? Not in one-on-one battle. Therefore, you know, the thought that Israel would become subjects the slaves of the Philistines was terrifying, terrifying to Israelites. Uh, the devil often mimics and parodies, you know, God in various forms. Uh, he wants to, like, kind of imitate the authority of God's word. However, the words of the devil cannot hold the same power uh, as God's. That's for sure. So the devil uses tactics like Roaring, you know, roaring like a lion to instill fear in people. Roaring lions. Uh, that causes them to become even like paralyzed in their thinking. That's what usually happens. So one of his, you know, the favorite strategies is to scare us off by instilling this fear in our mind. It would be very hard, it would be very hard to find someone, you know, who could defeat this guy who is enormous. Um, However, even if, you know, Goliath threatened them to fight one-on-one, you know, they could simply refuse, right? It's not that they didn't have a choice. They could have said, hey, that's a nonsense. You know, that's a nonsense. How can a super heavyweight can fight a flyweight each other? That doesn't sound fair, right? They could have just rejected. They could have just easily refused uh, what you know, Goliath had to say. Um, no matter how much of giant Goliath is or how strong he may be. You know, think about this. If 10 or if 10 is not enough, let's say 20, right? 20 Israel warriors attack him all together, like together, then there would be no chance of a victory for Goliath. You know, while a lion wins against a single hyena, if 20 hyenas attack, even a lion like, would likely abandon its catch and flee. Have you seen the geography, uh, national geographies and you know, all these power struggles between hyenas and lions? Yeah? So Goliath was indeed a formidable warrior with an impressive stature and strength. But because of that, the Israel soldiers had fallen into fear and was, you know, they were not able to think straight. They're, they're, you know, it just kind of made uh, very wrong judgments because of the fear. In our lives, uh, there are things like Goliath that instill fear in us. One of the, you know, those fears is the fear of not being accepted or uh, being rejected. And this fear can paralyze our thoughts. You know, much like Goliath, Goliath did to the Israelites. The people can do crazy things just to be accepted by people around. Have you seen that? People can do crazy things for approval. Um, so they lost, you know, like sound judgments, so to speak. Let's think about David's life. Uh, he had to struggle with the feelings of rejections almost for, her in, for his entire life, for a long time. After defeating Goliath, David gained much attention and became like a rising star. 
Uh, but due to the jealousy of King Saul, who was his father-in-law, you know, David was forced to flee for more than 10 years. You know, sense of this rejection uh, was probably even, you know, uh, traumatizing David for more than 10 years, right? He was rejected by the first king of Israel. And to make matters worse, this guy was his father-in-law. And David was rejected for that time, right? And that's not it. Not only that, David was experienced rejection from his son, Absalom, later in his life. He was someone who experienced the pain of rejection more than anyone else. And before even facing Goliath, if you read, and I'm sure that you know the story, but, you know, backdrop of the story, again, if you read these chapters in the book of Samuel, the first Samuel, then we see that David, he was rejected by his brother, the older brother, Eliab. Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, this is what he said. Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Uh, there's a saying in Korean. I'm not sure about English expressions, but there's a you know, Korean saying that the most entertaining sights in the world are fights and fires. Have you heard about that? Or do we have any kind of similar, uh, the American idioms or maxims or expressions? No? I think it reflects the fallen nature of humanity. Uh, David's older brother Eliab assumed that David had come to watch the fight with that mindset. Uh, he scornfully questioned why David had come and suggesting, you know, he should be just taking care of the sheep. So the question is, why did Eliab dismiss David in this way? Why? What was wrong with him? From 1 Samuel chapter 16, we find that the prophet Samuel visiting Jesse's house to anoint the one whom God would set as king after Saul. When Saul, or when Samuel, you know, first saw Eliab, he was pretty impressed. Uh, he was immediately convinced that Eliab was the chosen one because of his height and appearance. Um, however, God commanded Samuel to anoint Jesse's youngest son, David, the eighth of his sons. In Korean, Makdungi. It seems that Eliab experienced the feelings of rejection at that moment. He probably felt that, you know, he was humiliated before all his brothers and even including that, the youngest brother, David. So that must be why he was holding kind of grudges against David. But the question is, did God really reject Eliab? What do you say? Did God really reject him? No. God didn't reject him. It's the realm of God's sovereignty. If Eliab fails to accept, uh, you know, this sovereignty of the Lord and continues to compare himself to others, his life will inevitably become unhappier. That's it. The struggle with you know, comparison can lead to distorted views of oneself and one's purpose, preventing individuals from recognizing their unique contributions and the distinct plans God has for them. So that's what Eliab was missing. The second Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 to 21, it reads, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, 
he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Not everyone, not everyone needs to be a golden vessel, nor should they strive to be one. There must be, you know, also these wooden and clay vessels in God's house. The important thing is that regardless of what kind of vessel one becomes or the materials, it must be clean vessel. Amen? It must be clean vessel. And that matters the most. Only then can it be used as a valuable instrument, valuable vessels. David was a clean vessel. He was a clean vessel. The reason he was able to bravely confront and willing to fight Goliath was that he viewed the battle as a matter of God's glory at stake. So that motivated him. That compelled him to step up. He was not seeking recognition for his bravery or trying to advance his own status through this opportunity. He was not trying to take advantage of this opportunity. As recorded in today's passage, David boldly proclaimed before Goliath, and 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45 and 46, let me just read this verse one more time. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the, uh, the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. The last verse. Last verse. Let's just take a look at this last verse. That all the earth may know, not David, but that there is God in Israel. That was his focus. David entered this battle with a clear purpose of making the entire world aware of the God of Israel, not himself, not someone whose name was David. His intention was not to just showcase himself, but rather to reveal God's glory. I believe that you know, God sees and uses those who possess a heart dictated to glorify him as the Lord, if you have that mindset, if you have that mentality, then God sees you as a clean vessel. Amen? And God is willing to use those vessels. When engaging in the work of the Lord, if the desire for recognition from the people takes place, then it's almost inevitable that um, one will eventually uh, come across these disappointments, encounter these feelings of rejections. Because we cannot please everyone. That's the bottom line. So you will be frustrated. You will be disappointed. Therefore, the first principle to overcoming fear is to live for the glory of God rather than seeking a personal glory. So that's the first uh, the principle. By focusing on God's purposes, we can find strength and courage to face challenges without being paralyzed by fear of this rejection or failure. I'm sure that you know, a lot of you, most of you know uh, Jonathan Edwards. He was one of the leaders of this first great awakening in America, alongside George Whitfield. Um, his sermon titled, The Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That was the title of the sermon. Pretty strong, huh? It's delivered during the revival and became one of America's classics uh, to the extent that it was included in American textbooks at that time. Can you believe that? It was in the textbooks in a school. Edwards was exceptionally bright and entering the Yale University at the age of 12. He was like a genius, right? And later served as the president of Princeton University. 
It is not an exaggeration to say that you know, he made a significant mark in American history, therefore. However, despite his accomplishments, Pastor Edwards faced rejection from the church where he served for 23 years, and he was eventually dismissed, rejected by the congregations. But this was not due to any scandalous issues, but rather over a matter of concerning the qualification of those who were participating in Lord's Supper. So that was the issue. Edwards opposed the prevailing sentiment that everyone who had been baptized as an infant, so-called infant baptism, right? As a you know infant baptism, uh, Edwards. He believes that you know, they are not supposed to be participating in the Lord's Supper unless they show a good signs of repentance, genuine faith in Jesus. Um, but the congregation didn't like the idea because that's going against the church tradition in the back in the days. Make a long story short, the congregation used the excuse that the pastor Edwards spent too much time studying and not enough time visiting members to justify his dismissal. Can you believe that? We're talking about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards did not compromise in the face of fear, though. He did not compromise to maintain his reputation or recognition from the congregations. He firmly believed that it was not biblical sound. Uh, it was not biblically sound for individuals just merely baptized as infants to automatically participate in Lord's Supper. Um, his commitment to the truth over personal acceptance exemplifies the courage to stand firm in one's convictions. To overcome fear, we must live entirely for the glory of God. Often the challenge in evangelism stems from that fear. Um, speaking of evangelism, I know that the uh, relational evangelism is much more effective. But whether it is confrontational evangelism in the street or relational evangelism amongst your uh, friends or co-workers or family members, Either way, it takes courage to just bring out the name Jesus Christ. It takes courage to just articulate the gospel in today's culture, right? And we have this fearful rejections. And um, I personally, um, I've done many, many street evangelisms ever since I uh, became a stu- uh, the Christian when I was a student back in Binghamton, New York. Um, because, you know, like, I just opened up my spiritual eyes and, you know, this is totally new world that I've never known before. Um, so I wanted to introduce this Jesus to all the people that I knew. And not only that, you know, I was uh, willing to just meet new people, strangers, to... Uh, just let them know who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Um, after I became a pastor, um, you know, since I was uh, doing this campus ministry back in East Coast, um, I was in a campus uh, two or three times a week, and I met a lot of different students with the different backgrounds. Um, I continue to do so. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm immune to this fear of rejections. So whenever I just, you know, kind of initiate, take initiate the, uh, the conversations with the strangers, I have this fear, get nervous. Um, the yesterday, I met a lady in, uh, you know, the H Mart, and as um, soon as I just, you know, like, you know, greeted to this lady, this, you know, Korean lady, uh, she was kind of smiling at me. That's a good sign, right? Because we're getting all, you know, different facial expressions in the streets. 
if you want to talk about oh, Jesus, then, you know, it really takes a gut to start, right? Uh, but this lady was just smiling, and I'm like, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> so I was going to just, you know, deliver the message, you know, get the words out, the gospel. But then ended up that, you know, this lady, um, she's attending American church with her husband. Uh, her husband is American, and so I think they just serve a different church. But you know, um, from time to time, um, I think she just kind of dropped by our Korean service. Uh, I don't know how many times she did that, but uh, she just kind of visited our church uh, to make sure that, you know, she's getting some Korean messages as well, <laughs> or maybe getting Korean food as well. Um, so she just recognized me as the pastor of this church. So we kind of had a good conversations, but... Um, up until today, you know, whenever I just meet new people and try to just, you know, break the ice and then just, you know, uh, try to introduce who Jesus is, makes me nervous. I have that fear of rejections as well. But the reason why I keep on doing it is why? Because God is pleased. God is glorified as we articulate the gospel and make Him known to these neighbors. Amen? That's all that matters. It's not about me. I could be humiliated by people around in this community, but that's okay. As long as, you know, we bring out the gospel and articulate the truth, and out of a hundred, if there's only one person coming to Jesus, I still praise the Lord. That's what that matters. Therefore, the first step in overcoming the fear of rejection is to prioritize the glory of God above all else. Second, to overcome fear, we must acknowledge God's grace in all things. David did not forget the grace of God that protected and preserved him from lions and bears while tending his sheep. In persuading King Saul to allow him to fight Goliath, David kind of recounted his experience as a shepherd, where he killed lions and bears to protect his flock. That's amazing stories, right? He shared how he cut the lion and bear by its beard and struck it down. Can you believe that? I'm not making this up. This is what David said. Okay, He just cut the lion or bear's beard in one hand and then just punch it to death. That's what happened. Hard to believe, but that's what he said. Uh, he's not, you know, suddenly Samson, but he just did that, right? How come he was able to do it? First Samuel chapter 17, verse 37, he's giving us a hint. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. While he uh, may have trained and prepared against wild animals, I'm sure that he did. He trained all he could do, but the more important truth that he confessed was what? The Lord's grace. It was the Lord's grace saving him. He just confessed that. He just admitted that. He acknowledged that. The same thing applies to us. As we are freed from the power of the devil, the enemy who prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, it is not because of our own bravery or capabilities or abilities that we are saved, but through the grace of God, by believing in Jesus Christ, we are saved. If we truly believe this, we must acknowledge God's grace in all areas of our lives. The love we have received from God in His grace will not be hindered by anything in this world. Isn't that good news? As the scripture reminds us, love casts out fears. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, it reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall 
tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Jesus conquered the fear of being separated from God the Father on our behalf. I want you to think about that. So try you and God. You know, our God never separated before. There was no beginning. There's no end. They were together forever. But to die for us, to just nail our sins on the cross, Jesus had to separate from God Father, which he never experienced before. There was probably tremendous fear. But he overcame. Why? Because he loves us so much that he was willing to take that fear and just nail it to the cross. Therefore, if you and I are in Christ, there's nothing to fear. Amen? Amen. Finally, the third way to overcome fear is to be filled, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, did David have a clear assurance that he would win against Goliath uh, before the battle? What do you think? Did he really know? 100%? Yes, in today's passage, we can see that. Because verse 47, And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear, For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. So it's not like, oh, 90%, 99%, but it's 100%. 100%, right? He had that assurance. Now, did Israel win every battle in Israel's history? No, that is not the case. Just reading through the book of, you know, like Joshua and Judges, it reveals that Israel experienced many defeats in battle. For example, uh, during the time of uh, uh, the Eli, Eli, uh, Israel fought against the Philistines and even lost the Ark of the Covenant. So they thought that as long as they just carried this, you know, the Word of God, the the uh, the Ark, then they thought that, you know. the victory belonged to them because this, you know, uh, the Word of God, this ark represents and signifies the God's presence. So as long as, you know, God's presence is with us, how can we lose the game? So that was the mentality, the mindset. But they lost. Not only that, this ark was taken by the Philistines. That was a big defeat, Right? If that's the case, how did David have such assurance of a victory? How did he know? We see the hint from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. It reads, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Can you see that? God's Spirit, it's anointing. It was with David. Not just one time. Not just one time. Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. That's the key. I believe that, you know, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the darkness of worry, anxiety, and fear will depart. Amen? The important thing is that just as the Spirit of the Lord continually inspired David from the day forward, 
We should not be satisfied with just one experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I know that, you know, as long as you call Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as long as you can call God as your Father, Daddy, then the Holy Spirit is already dwelling in you. But just don't be content. That's not it. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit day and night. Day in, day out. We must desire the Holy Spirit filling us that it may drive out all that darkness, anxieties, worries, and fears, and all that negativities. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure that the Holy Spirit reminded David that one day, someday, he would be the second king of Israel. That's what this anointing was all about, right? So he just trusted the promise from the Lord that he would become a king of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was highlighting and just helping him to stand firm on that promise. That's what he does with the Bible even today, right? It's not just a mechanical process that we read, that memorize and study and try to just live by the words without the Holy Spirit. Forget it. Not going to happen. It's got to be the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live according to His will written in this book. So because of the promise, you know, he could easily assure the victory, right? If he lost, then what? He would be killed by Goliath. If that was the case, he could not be a king of Israel. But he trusted the Lord that God would keep his promise. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. So that is the secret. Let me just wrap up the message for today. Do not overlook that the enemy in our lives, in your hearts, still the enemy is spreading the seeds of fear, doubt, anxieties, and all that. Don't just overlook Although it may seem to be very insignificant as of now, but if left unchecked, they can grow into monstrous Goliath in your life. We have to deal with it ASAP. Recognize God's fight against, recognize God's grace in all things. And diligently seek and receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit every day and live for God's glory. Amen? Amen. Let's take this time to pray. And I will just wrap up with my prayer. So let's take this time to pray. If you can, just pray out loud, but you don't have to. But this time, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to shine upon us and help us to see uh, to navigate some of the fears deep in our hearts. What are you afraid of? Is it, is it failure? Is it multiple rejections and not being accepted? What are you afraid the most? Whatever that is, as we just lay down all that fears, before our Jesus Christ this morning. May the Lord continue to reign over our hearts, over our lives. So let's just ask His help. Let's continue to ask His Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time. I know that I have a fear deep in my heart. Sometimes that's a fear of failures in the ministries. Sometimes that's uh, the fear of not being accepted by church members. Uh, Father God, I just lay them down before you once again, Lord, asking that 
you just nail them down to the cross that I no longer live but you Christ lives in me Jesus whatever I do Lord God whether eat or drink I want to do it for your glory Father God would you help us that everything that we do here as a church is to glorify your awesome name lifting up your awesome name not our names Lord God it's all about you it's not about us it's not about me it's about you Jesus would you help us to fix our eyes upon you Jesus this morning and Father God help us to acknowledge your blessing and grace in every step of our lives not only the things that we do in the church settings but in our daily lives in our routines in our homes and workplace wherever we go father god help us to see your grace and acknowledge it lord it is by your grace that we are here not our efforts not our accomplishments but this is what you've done at the cross that compels us to serve you that compels us to further your kingdom with all our strength but without your grace there's nothing we can do so would you continue to pour out your grace upon us Lord? and father we just pray that your spirit will fill us day in day out help us to be filled by the spirit would you anoint us with your spirit every day that we may get reminded of the scriptures the truth that we want compromise with this world with this fallen world help us lord god have a mercy upon us lord god convict our hearts with your words and with your spirit help us to continue to honor you and live for you as we seek your kingdom and your righteousness first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, as we just wrap up the message, we just get reminded of the fact that it is your grace, by your grace that we stand before you this morning. Not our efforts, not our own self-righteousness, but because of what you've done in our lives. Because of your death and resurrection at the cross, we are here before your presence. So would you help us to count all the blessings and grace that we've been receiving from you? Would you help us to stay humble and fix our eyes upon you that Whatever we do, we may do it for your glory. God, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit day in, day out, that we may truly be able to live by your words. We just cannot do it with our own efforts, with our own strength, but by your Spirit. By your Spirit. Nothing is impossible. So God, we pray that you would fill us with your presence and spirit as we seek you, as we seek your face, as we praise you, as we pray, as we worship, as we have a fellowship in Christ. May we do it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever.